Thoracic outlet syndrome. It is probably one of the most controversial topics in medicine. If you're watching this video, you might think that you have TOS. And if so, you've come to the right place. Because today, I'll explain to you everything you need to know about this enigmatic disease. My name is Cameron Nagayev. I'm a neurosurgeon. And welcome to Neurosurgery Explained. First, I must tell you that this video is not a medical advice. It is purely for educational purposes and aims to give you comprehensive information about thoracic outlet syndrome. Let's start with definition. What is thoracic outlet syndrome? The thoracic outlet syndrome, or simply TOS, is a general term describing several conditions associated with compression of nerves and vessels in the thoracic outlet area. Well, what does this definition mean? It means that if you have TOS, some nerves and blood vessels in thoracic outlet area are physically smashed. Okay, so far so good. But this definition creates two very important questions. First question, what is the thoracic outlet area? Or specifically, where is the thoracic outlet area? It is an area located at the top of the chest cavity, kind of representing an exit. If you imagine the chest cavity as a chimney, the thoracic outlet area is a ventilation window. Strictly speaking, it's not a good definition because there is nothing physically coming out of this outlet. It's just an upper boundary of chest cavity. Believe it or not, in all publica publications, this area was sometimes called thoracic inlet area. Anyway, this area has a heart-shaped contour bounded by the first thoracic vertebra, the left and right first ribs, and the upper edge of the sternum. Second question, what are the nerves and vessels compressed in thoracic outlet area? The answer is the brachial plexus, subclavian artery, and subclavian vein. Okay, that may be a little bit too techni technical, so let's elaborate. Brachial plexus is a network of nerves connecting the spinal cord with the arm. This plexus carries impulses between the spinal cord and the arm. The nerves are basically communication lines and impulses are bits of information flowing to and from the arm. These impulses are electrical signals and they control skin sensation, muscle contraction, sweating, blood vessel tone, everything, you name it. If nerves are compromised, then the flow of signals is disrupted, which leads to the disease. Subclavian artery and vein are two vessels providing blood flow to the arm and from the arm back to the heart. They are essentially pipelines with blood flowing inside of them. When they are compressed from outside, they become narrow and blood flow gets obstructed. Okay, depending on what structure is affected, TOS has three clinical variants. Neurogenic form, or NTOS, is the most common form. Estimates give approximately 80 to 85% from all TOS cases. Brachial plexus is compressed, which means that symptoms develop due to disruption of neural impulses. These symptoms include pain, numbness, tingling sensation, um, pins and needles, and muscle weakness. The skin of the fourth and fifth fingers is typically affected. Venous TOS, or uh, VTOS. It's a less common variant, about 15 to 20 percent of cases. Subclavian vein is compressed and the symptoms develop due to insufficient blood flow return from the arm. You may think that more blood in my arm may be a good thing. Unfortunately, that is not the case. You see, venous blood contains waste products and very little oxygen which negatively affects the arm. Venous congestion is like a traffic jam. Symptoms of venous TOS include cyanosis, which is dark blue discoloration, swelling or edema, visible large veins, and pain. 
Arterial TOS or ATOS is the least common form, approximately 1-2% to of all TOS cases. The subclavian artery is compressed, which leads to insufficient flow to the affected arm. This causes symptoms like paleness, coldness, and pain in the arm and hand. Fingertips are particularly affected, and in very severe cases, ischemia may develop. Typically, TOS patients experience problems with keeping their arms above the head, like this. Hair care, phone holding, and other overhead activities are painful, numbing, and difficult. TOS is a collective term describing the site of the disease rather than the cause. The term is like other entrapment neuropathies like carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome. It says basically nothing about the cause of the condition. To make things worse, there is no single factor causing thoracic outlet syndrome. Multiple causes have been identified. For example, women are affected three to four times more often than men. People extensively using their arms and hands for work also tend to develop TOS. Scientific evidence showed that the cause is skeletal and muscle abnormalities. These abnormalities are frequently very subtle, making them very hard to diagnose. So now we will discuss most common underlying conditions for thoracic outlet syndrome. Cervical accessory rib. Normally, there are 12 pairs of ribs in human body, totally 24. They form the chest cavity and provide protection for the heart and lungs, and essential for normal breathing. Some people have additional or accessory cervical ribs. Recent large-scale meta-analysis found that 1.1% of the general population has cervical ribs. The incidence of cervical ribs in 2S patients is 29%, which means that if you have cervical rib, then you have 25 more times of developing 2S than general population. These ribs extend from the seventh cervical vertebra above the first rib. The shape and the size of accessory ribs may be different, from a slightly elongated transverse process to a well-formed, almost normally looking ribs. These extra ribs either directly compress the nerves and vessels or distort the pass, leading to thoracic outlet syndrome. Accessory ribs are very easy to diagnose on x-rays, well, if you're familiar with them. Unfortunately, in most cases, that is not the case, because most physicians are inexperienced with them, and they are frequently missed. First rib abnormalities. First rib is a C-shaped flat bone. It formed the most part of the thoracic outlet area and is the main culprit for TOS. The problem may come from the shape or the position of the first rib. For example, one study found that widening of the first rib is strongly associated with thoracic outlet syndrome. Another study has found that abnormal bone prominence is responsible for venous congestion. Unlike cervical ribs, these abnormalities are less evident on x-rays and hard to diagnose. Only well-experienced specialists may notice them. And sometimes a CT scan with additional three-dimensional remodeling is necessary to identify these problems. Fibromuscular soft tissue bands. These bands constitute a significant portion of TOS cases. The cause of compression may be an abnormal muscle, a fibrous band, or a combination of them. Scalenus anticus, scalenus minimus, and subclavius posticus are examples of such muscles, although their incidence is relatively rare.
These structures are basically bands or strings. They are present in the thoracic outlet area and compress the neurovascular bundle. Hypertrophic muscles. Hypertrophic muscles may also cause compression in the thoracic outlet area. In case if you don't know, hypertrophic means big. People extensively using their arms and hands for work and sports can develop thoracic outlet syndrome. For example, professional athletes, musicians, hairdressers, they are prone to developing 2S. Skull and muscle hypertrophy usually leads to neurogenic and arterial 2S, since both artery and brachial plexus run inside skull and triangle. Subclavius muscle hypertrophy, on the other hand, causes compression and sometimes even thrombosis of the subclavian vein. This clinical variant is called paget schroter disease. Postoclavicular compression. Both clavicle and first rib make joint with the upper part of the sternum. First rib is fixed, but clavicle is quite mobile. Clavicle is attached to the sternum and connects the arm with the rest of the body. It is basically a lever. When arm moves up, the clavicle changes its position and the distance between the clavicle and first rib gets smaller. This gap between the clavicle and the first rib is called costoclavicular space and usually it is quite wide. Nerves and vessels freely pass through this space. When arm is raised, this space may get very narrow. It is called a nutcracker mechanism. Studies show that in normal per person, costoclavicular distance does not change very much with arm movements, while in TOS patients, it dramatically decreases. This nutcracker mechanism is the leading cause of the thoracic outlet syndrome, but it's not easy to diagnose. The best choice is to use MRI because it allows direct measurement of the distance between the clavicle and the first rib. But MRI scan should be performed with arms in up and down position. This is called provocative imaging. But because we provoke narrowing to show on MRI, only by showing significant narrowing of the space with provoking testing, we can confirm the diagnosis. Unfortunately, this technique is not widely used. Neurovascular conflict. Another less known mechanism for TOS comes from subclavian artery or vein branches. These branches loop around the brachial plexus and may directly compress or tether the nerves. These vascular causes have been identified as the source of TOS relatively recently, and research in this area is still going on. Chronic kidney disease and dialysis. What does chronic kidney disease and dialysis have to do with TOS? Well, nothing. It is not the disease, but the way we treat it causes TOS. Therapeutic arterial venous fistula is a very common method used for easy vascular access in hemodialysis patients. However, one of the major shortcomings is increased blood flow and the turbulence in the subclavian vein. This leads to central venous stenosis and thoracic outlet syndrome. <clears throat> like in most venous thoracic outlet syndrome cases, this stenosis usually develops in the costoclavicular space where the nutcracker effect between the clavicle and first rib exists. Now we will discuss the treatment of the thoracic outlet syndrome. Well, what is the treatment for thoracic outlet syndrome? It is usually said that light cases or moderate cases should be managed conservatively. Armrest, physical therapy, painkiller, breathing exercises, stretching, postural exercises may be helpful.
But physical therapy usually does not provide permanent relief, especially if there is underlying musculoskeletal anatomic abnormality. In case, if you missed the previous section, that's almost all TOS cases. There are not too many studies regarding the efficacy of physical therapy in TOS. The only one prospective randomized study found that surgery provides better results in comparison with conservative treatment. Since the cause of TOS is anatomical, at least in majority of cases, the surgery is the only way to permanently treat the disease. Surgery aims to decompress the thoracic outlet area and therefore is called thoracic outlet decompression or TOID. To achieve the decompression, the surgeon must remove the first rib, find nerves, artery, and vein, and free them up by cutting all muscular and fibrotic bands. This is how the surgery should be done. Well, in theory at least. But in practice, I'm afraid we are far from away from ideal. To make it easy, some surgeons do not remove first rib and perform only soft tissue release. Yes, I know it's hard to believe that this is how things are in 21st century, but this is done every day. And some surgeons actually defend this method. They regularly publish scientific papers about this technique, and according to them, it is a good option for TOS treatment. This procedure is called neurolysis or neuroplasty. The efficacy has been studied only in one prospective randomized trial. By the way, prospective randomized trials provide best evidence in medicine. They are not ideal but they are the best from what we have. Back to the topic. This study compared the first rib resection with no resection and found that rib removal provides significantly better results. And the surgeons came to conclusion that, quote, the major compressive element in patients with TOS associated pain appeared to be the first rib, end of quote. Now we know that the first rib removal is an essential part of thoracic outlet decompression. But this is the area where there are a lot of confusion. And I'm not talking about public. Even many doctors don't have enough information about this matter. Basically, not all rib resections are equal. There is overwhelming scientific evidence indicating that the extent of first rib removal influences success. It basically means more bone removal gives better results. Partial or incomplete removal leaves bone stumps, which cause recurrence. One study from Italy found that length of the remaining rib stumps affect the success of surgery. Similar results came later in 2014 from John Hopkins University. Basically, all high-quality studies indicate that in order to achieve good results, the first rib should be completely removed. Keep this information in mind because we will return to this matter again when we discuss surgical methods. Yes, we will discuss surgical techniques in detail because they are super important. This information is absolutely crucial, so pay attention, especially if you're considering surgery for your TOS treatment. Anterior supraclavicular approach. The surgeon approached the brachial plexus and subclavian vessels from the front. That's what anterior means and above the clavicle, that what subclav subclavicular means. So it means that the approach is from the front and above the collarbone, that simple. The major handicap of this approach is limited access to the first rib. Removal, and I mean 
complete removal is technically very difficult because the first rib is located deep under the brachial plexus and subclavian artery and subclavian vein. So to reach and remove the first rib, nerves and vessels should be moved away. But the nerves and vessels do not like manipulation. They may get hurt and several complications may develop during or after the surgery. A recent large literature review from Japan analyzed the outcomes and complications of each surgical technique. This report found that the complete relief rate is only 57% and the risk of neurological injury is 3%. Also, there is a small but real risk of vascular injury and death. As I mentioned, it is very difficult, almost impossible to completely remove the first rib from anterior approach. Therefore, usually bone leftovers remaining after surgery. These stumps cause recurrence of symptoms. The patients sometimes do not benefit from surgery at all or develop a recurrence after some improvement period. Some patients may become worse than before because of nerve man manipulation during surgery. Lateral or transaxillary approach. The surgeon approaches the first rib from the armpit. That's what lateral transaxillary means. This approach is used by thoracic surgeons. The wound is usually narrow and very deep, and the only mid portion of the first rib can be reached. Therefore, vascular TOS cases, primarily arterial TOS, can be effectively treated. The posterior portion, the back portion of the first rib, is very hard, not impossible though, to expose and remove with this approach. Literature review found 53% of complete relief rate and 5% risk of neurological injury. Again, there is small but real risk of vascular injury and death. So the results of this approach are quite similar to anterior supraclavicular approach. The main problem with this approach is inability to remove the first rib completely. Another major handicap of transaxillary approach is limited access to brachial plexus itself. Even the entire first rib resection is performed only a very limited portion of brachial plexus can be visualized and decompressed. You can't really go high with this approach because your starting point is very low. So soft tissue bundles usually remain after surgery and this is another reason for recurrence. Anterior infraclavicular approach. This approach is used exclusively for venous TOS. Surgeon approaches the first rib from an incision below the collarbone. This is what infraclavicular means. Only front portion of the first rib can be reached and removed. Therefore, only subclavian vein can be decompressed. It is a good surgical choice, but only for isolated venous TOS cases like McCleary syndrome or Paget Schroeter syndrome. But it's not universal. Neurogenic and arterial TOS are not suitable for an anterior infraclavicular approach. And you may remember that neurogenic form is the most frequent clinical variant. Endoscopic and robotic approaches. These approaches are relatively new and have evolved over the last 20 or so years. Endoscope, surgical tools, or robotic systems are placed inside the chest cavity and the first rib is approached from below. The main problem with this technique is, again, incomplete resection of the first rib leading to recurrence. So clinical outcomes 
for endoscopic and robotic TOS surgery are very similar to traditional supraclavicularly and transaxillary approaches. Purit. As you can see, all surgical techniques used for uh, TOS are suffering from the same setback, which is inability to remove the first rib completely. Therefore, I invented, I developed Purit technique in 2015 and I've been implementing it since then. Purit is an acronym. It means posterior, upper, rib excision and decompression. The surgery is performed from the back. First, the transverse process of C7 and T1 are removed. Then the first rib is divided into two parts. This division increases the mobility of the remaining pieces and makes it easy for surgeon to remove the rest. First, the small part is removed piece by piece. Then the muscles are detached from the big part and is gradually removed by small bites. During this process, the nerves and the artery are not disturbed. Only the subclavian vein is slightly moved up to expose and remove the very last bit of the first rib. Once the rib is completely resected, scalenectomy is performed and the nerves and vessels are decompressed completely. The surgical working line is in the plane with the first rib and exposure and removal of the first rib is very easy and straightforward. Entire first rib can be removed with this approach with zero leftovers. During rib removal, there is no nerve manipulation. There are two main advantages of this approach, efficacy and safety. There are no rib leftovers and neurologists and neuroplasty can be performed widely, which makes this approach the most effective treatment of TOS ever employed. There is simply no other surgical technique which can allow such an unprecedented exposure. Second advantage is safety. There is not much manipulation with the nerves and vessels during the surgery. Therefore, procedure has a very low complication rate. I have performed more than 100 surgeries over the last 10 years and have not seen any significant complications like neurological injury or vascular injury, which may have permanent effect on patients. And therefore, none of my patients have developed recurrence. This concludes our video today regarding thoracic outlet syndrome. So if you have enjoyed this one, you might hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next video.